discriminant function analysis is a natural extension of the cluster analysis we did last week. The two primary objectives of DFA are first to describe differences among groups that you've already identified, such as via cluster analysis, and secondly, to predict the likelihood that an object of unknown origin can be correctly assigned to one of the groups or clusters based on some a suite of discriminating characteristics. As such, DFA is an eigenanalysis uh, technique that maximally, maximally separates a fixed number of a priori defined groups. It's thus a form of ordination where the objective is to find axes that represent linear combinations of variables that maximize the grouping of objects into separate classes that best differentiate groups in your data. In DFA, the independent variables in your data set are used as the predictors of group membership, and the groups themselves are the dependent variables. So DFA generates synthetic variables, the discriminant functions, that maximize the formation of separate clusters of objects. To determine whether the predefined groups really differ from each other, and to identify which variables best account for these differences, we will use a CART analysis, classification and regression trees approach. Unlike cluster analysis, DFA requires you to specify an a priori number of groups. And therefore, cluster analysis is often done as a precursor of DFA because the cluster analysis is done to identify groups and then the DFA is used to describe how those groups differ. It therefore can be thought of as a form of ordination because it creates discriminant functions, synthetic variables, that maximize the separation of objects within groups. In other words, it maximizes the distances between clusters and minimizes the distance within clusters. In, in this sense, distance is being used um, as dissimilarity, as we've done throughout uh, the semester. Um, the power of DFA is that these algorithms can then be used for predictive classification of new objects of unknown provenance into one of the groups based on the values of the measured explanatory variables. The DFA is then examined to determine whether objects drawn iteratively from the data set can be correctly classified to their appropriate group and so you have to collect you have to check your misclassification rates and we'll talk about what an acceptable misclassification error rate is a little later today to check the rate of misclassification we will use a tree classifier approach such an approach is often generically called cart but technically, CART is one specific copyrighted and trademarked tree classifier example, and there are many others out there. We will then build a confusion matrix to determine which groups are consistently confused with which other groups. DFA assumes that you have homogeneous within group variances. That in fact is what allows you to say that this is a group. Remember that the objective of DFA is to um, minimize the distance within groups and maximize the dif distance between groups. And so you need to have very homogeneous variances within your groups. But this is often violated when your sample sizes are unequal and small. It also assumes multivariate normality within your groups. But fortunately, it's reasonably robust to violations of this, although it is um, uh, particularly sensitive to outliers. And so you really ought to screen your data for outliers and cull any outliers first. It assumes that there are linear relationships among variables, but as we've seen before, that this is often violated with ecological community data. And so you may need to perform a data transformation first, um, for example, a logarithmic or power transformation. And then finally, 
it assumes that your groups have equal probability of being sampled. These are called the prior probabilities. And these are sampling probabilities for each of your predefined groups. But they are seldom known, and so they're typically assumed to be proportional to the number of samples in each group. This is important for that iterative classification process I talked about in the previous slide, where you randomly draw members from your data and try to correctly classify them to their groups. If a certain group has uh, an unequal probability of being chosen, then that will skew that process. In the example worked through in the online notes for today, we were working once again with a Bryce Canyon vegetation data set. And then we also use the environmental variables from the Bryce site data set to determine whether or not those independent variables could be used to predict the membership of the groups. So in order to do DFA, you first have to start out with a distance matrix. And we use the distance, the Bray Curtis distance metric, really for consistency with previous lessons. Then you have to perform a cluster analysis on that distance matrix. And we did two. Uh, first was a hierarchical cluster analysis using the complete linkage approach or the farthest neighbor method. And we also did a single linkage or nearest neighbor method. And then you can compare the outcome of the two. And then to examine the validity of the resulting tree, we used a package called tree, uh, which allowed us to examine the outcome of our, our branchings, our, our groupings, um, via a cart approach. So here's the dendrogram that results from the cluster analysis um, the, that uses the complete linkage method. And as you can see, each one of the sites um, is the, the terminal point on each node. Well, that's not what we want. What we want are clusters. We want clusters of sites. And so what I did was I sliced the tree at a height of 0.99 to generate clusters, and that resulted in eight clusters with the sites being grouped into one of those eight clusters. And so now we have something to analyze. So now that we have groupings, we can perform DFA and use it to examine how those groups of sites differ with respect to environmental variables. There are many ways of doing so. Today we used a decision tree approach or a tree classifiers approach. Tree classifiers act like dichotomous keys that you're probably familiar with in taxonomy. In our example, we use the Bryce site data set to determine how well the clusters reflected environmental differences. We examined elevation, slope, aspect value, soil depth, and topographic position. And that's a mixture of both numeric or continuous variables and categorical variables. And here's the resulting tree. This tree grows downward, and each split along each branch as you travel down the tree is labeled with the respective criterion for splitting. The height of each vertical bar above each split reflects the decrease in deviance associated with that split. Deviance um, is similar to variance. And in fact, I think of it as um, division variance in that it assesses the variability around an estimate or a model. And in our case, it is a model of can you split things? Can you cause them to deviate from each other? Um, so the, val the, the goal of this is to achieve low values of deviance without overfitting the model. And here's the output of the model, which is a bit intimidating at first until you see the logic of it. It's a dichotomous key. And the first line is the root or the trunk of the tree, if you will. And it indicates that there are 145 plots 
it dropped out ones with any missing values, NA values, from our 160 original sites. And the null deviance is 501.9. Cluster 2 is the null. And the respective probability of occurrence in each one of the eight clusters is given as 0 0.25517, 0 0.27586, and so on and so forth. So from this line in your R output, I couldn't fit it all into this um, slide, um, you could see that um, um, cluster um, uh, 6 had the highest probability of being resolved. Okay, so that's how you read each line. And notice how these things are tabbed in. Okay, so then the next division is here, 2, and 3. Within 2, there's then here 4, and steps 4 and 5, and then here 6 and 7, and so on and so forth. So you do read it kind of like a, a dichotomous key. Um, so had we followed branch 3, which I put here in yellow to make it a little bit easier to see, um, there would be 62 plots in the resulting clusters with a deviance of 83.61, and the most likely cluster um, it resolves to is number 1. So the objective of the tree classifier is to minimize the deviance of the tree with each split, and the optimal split is calculated by comparing reductions in deviance at each one of these numbered steps. The sum of the respective deviances after the first split after the root, um, so that would be the tabbed entries 2 and 3. Notice how they're at the same tab depth. So you add those two deviances together, uh, that 83.61 and 273.2, you add them together and that is less than the root deviance of 501.9. Um, and in fact, we achieved a great reduction in deviance with just that single split. And that suggests a good ability to discriminate between at least two uh, clusters. The branches continue splitting until they become homogeneous or they become too small to split. The minimum terminal node size is 10, and the minimum number of plots to split off is 5. Once the tree is finished splitting, then the terminal nodes are designated with asterisks at the end of a line. Okay, so now let's take a look at a simple summary of the results. There are three important pieces of information that are presented here uh, in the simple summary. Uh, first, it tells us that even though we told it, hey, use these five environmental variables in the model, it only used or only needed to use three of them, elevation, slope, and aspect value. It dropped soil depth and topographic position. Um, at each split, the best variable that gives the maximum reduction in deviance is used, and it can be used more than once, like elevation was. In our example, soil depth and topographic position were never used, and so were dropped from the final analysis. The second important piece of information is that although there were only eight clusters to predict, there are 10 terminal nodes. That's because there can be more than one combination of variables that gets you to a given cluster. And then finally, the misclassification error rate was 20.69% or 30 out of 145 sites. There is no consensus as to what an acceptable uh, error rate is, but you certainly want something better than 50%. I did a quick search on Google Scholar and saw published rates ranging from 5 to 27 percent misclassification rates. With any error rate that's greater than zero, then you also need to determine which types were confused with which other types. And you can view this in a table that's called a confusion matrix. In this matrix, the actual values are the columns and the predicted values are the rows.
And so the diagonals are the correct assignments. And so you can see some confusion here, hence the name, between types uh, 1 and 2, which I've put here in green. So there were 14 errors in resolving those two clusters, and between um, types 2 and 6, which I've shown in blue here, and there were seven errors there. And you can also see where the missing cluster types were 4 and 8 were allocated. Uh, cluster 4 was misclassified into clusters 3 and 7, for example. The true discriminatory power of your model can really only be found via cross-validation. And what you do is you use 90% of your data to train your model and then a randomly withheld 10% of it to test it in an independent test of your data with your data that weren't used to construct the model. This is best done with large data sets, and, and so we didn't do it here. The examples we worked through were to examine community diversity across sites, since, after all, this is a class about ecological communities. But DFA is often used, actually probably most commonly used, to separate out other types of groupings. Um, for example, suppose you collect an individual that you suspect may belong to a new species. It's similar to known species, but is just different enough to make you wonder. You can use DFA on morphometric traits from your individual compared to individuals of known species to determine how distinct your individual is and how likely it is to be misclassified as a known species. This kind of DFA analysis is best performed with the LDA function from the package mass, and it creates different kinds of plots like the one shown here, which really shows DFA's heritage as a form of ordination. Um, I didn't include any examples with LDA in our lessons because none of the data sets that we have been using really allow themselves to be analyzed readily with LDA. And also, it's really not our primary focus. Remember, our focus is site by species and, and site by environment data sets, and that's really not uh, what we have here. But if you Google examples of DFA, you will often see uh, plots like this and, and uses like this. For the next two slides, however, I'll show you some examples where DFA was used to examine community diversity. And the first example here is actually from one of my former students' um, dissertation projects. Um, in this study, Brian Reese sampled the dragonfly and damselfly communities that uh, odonates, odonata is the insect order for dragonflies and damselflies, at Playa Wetlands that were surrounded either by cropland or by grassland or rangeland and, and wanted to see whether or not um, that land use land cover type could be used to distinguish the communities of, or the assemblages really, of, of odonates here. And so uh, we did this um, in the days before R, we did this in SAS, and this is the kind of plot um, that we generated in, in this plot, the, the symbols um, are the different sites based on different land use land cover types. And again, as a form of ordination, in this case, 100% uh, of the variance was given on one axis, which we have presented here as a vertical axis. And so what you're seeing is, look at all the, the black circles are on the top and all of the uh, white squares are on the bottom. Um, you're looking at vertical separation, not horizontal uh, separation here. So uh, this is an example of how DFA can be used to examine differences in community with environmental variables. Here's another example, uh, much more complicated. Uh, these authors used NMDS, which is shown in plot A, RDA, 
in plot B, and then they used a cart approach in plot C to compare the microbial community on three types of organic amendments to soil in two soil types compared to a control. And what I want to want to point out for this lesson really is this plot down here, plot C. And you can tell that it looks very, very similar to the approach that, that we took. Um, although the authors of this paper did not specify anything about the DFA that they did. Um, they just said, we did DFA. They did not indicate with what software. They didn't indicate whether this is based on complete linkage or single linkage. <sighs> but you can see that what they're looking for is, or, or what they show is that there is some consistency in that there is separation of the microbial community based on the three soil amendment treatments with differences by soil types and that they were different from the controls and that these were in this case ultimately based on a series of um, soil traits that they measured. So for your assignment this week, your last assignment for this class, you're going to do a different type of cluster analysis and then perform DFA on it and compare that outcome to the outcome we got through the example that we worked through in the online uh, notes um, to see which one really had the most misclassifications. Then what you're going to do is you're going to perform a DFA on another data set, the grassland community data set that we used last time in the lesson on cluster analysis. Um, you're going to use a hierarchical cluster method using the average linkage approach. And then you're going to use environmental variables from the plot metadata file um, and perform an analysis and then do an evaluation of it. Um, what was the misclassification rate? How would you interpret that? And so forth. This course covered some, but by no means all, of the multivariate statistical approaches that are taken to analyze data from ecological communities using the R freeware statistical analysis package. So now you have a foundation in the most important and common types of analyses needed to understand ecological communities and in the use of R to conduct those analyses. R is perhaps the most widely used statistical analysis package now, having replaced SAS and JUMP and SYSTAT and SPSS and so forth in government and nonprofit agencies because it's free, it's transparent, and it's flexible. And so this course has kind of been a buy one, get one free class. Learn stats and learn some R alongside with it. But there are many other R packages that can do many of the analyses that we did with other options. And there are lots of other ways to generate more attractive plots. I encourage you to explore what packages might be useful to you in analyzing your own data. And there are many other analyses that are relevant to understanding ecological communities. We covered the foundational analyses, but in no great depth. Your own research objectives may require analyses that we did not cover. And so even though we're at the end of this course, you all are really at the start of your statistical analyses of ecological communities.